Great, here we go. So um, welcome everybody to the artist talk for the show found featuring artists Carrie Kessler, Anna McRae, Mia Sarani, and David Trailer with uh, inspired by the writings of William Marsh. So we're going to go ahead and get started with this talk. Um, and I'm just wondering at the beginning here, how did you guys come up with this show? Like, what is the inspiration for this particular theme? I guess, I, guess I, I'm, I guess I'm the instigator. Uh, uh, we've been, we've been um, working, Billy and I have been working for quite a while on different projects. And one of the ideas that we came up with is this idea of lost and found, and it all started with an encounter I had with some, a couple of homeless guys in uh, uh, at Operation Nightwatch, where they had lost their luggage, and somebody was trying to Track them down, and give, them, give them back their luggage that they had found on um, uh, Aurora Avenue. And so that just started head of the thought, and we just had to expand it. And I asked Billy to start, uh, if he would, inter was interested, and he started dream writing. And then we um, gathered some three other amazing artists who sort of joined, joined the talk. Excellent. That's a, it's a really interesting inspiration for this particular show. Um, Billy, this show is inspired by your writing. Can you tell us a little bit about the ideas in this body of writing, how you came up with them, and specifically this dynamic of lost and found as an important part of lived experience? Sure. Well, first of all, I have to thank you for that as I begin to talk. But as I begin to unpack the ideas of, of lost found, it began to take me in many different directions, like, like everything and nothing, structure and form, seasons and time, where and nowhere. And then, uh, the dimensions begin to snowball. And as I uh, watch the art taking shape, that <laughs> helped me to further orient in what I wanted to do with the essays. And so I, I felt like you know, we had achieved a, a bit of a synergy. Um, and so what I felt like when I finally completed the essays was uh, me being influenced and them being influenced then having it all come together. That's, that's really fascinating. I didn't realize that you had written part of it after the fact, right? So that's, that's super interesting. Um, I was wondering if, if this experience of working with these artists has catalyzed new ideas for you or influenced your ideas in some way. What is it like to be such an important part of this collaboration? Well, it's been... <laughs> it's been an honor for sure. It's been a, it's been a great joy to work with these four artistic minds and hearts and to watch their creative juices flow into many, many directions. And I have drawn some of the themes for my essays from the themes of their art. And it's been a very vitalizing experience for me and I, because I do a lot of academic writing, some pretty dense philosophical writing like ordinarily, and to do these essays on much more colorful themes and to work with people outside academia, this was, it was very refreshing, it was good. 
such a cool collaboration. I really like that collaborative aspect, aspect of this particular show. And I have to note, some of the work in the show is part of the collaboration and some of it is not. So there is independently produced work that's that's hanging in a certain area, but like there, there are two different kind of shows that are running in parallel. But just speaking about the work that's inspired by Billy's writing, um, despite this pandemic, you guys still got together online, right? This pandemic is keeping us apart physically, but you organized this exhibition and worked together on the ideas that you're exploring in this show. So how did you work together at a distance for this? And how has your understanding of the kind of groundlessness of loss and the creative work of finding been influenced by working together as a group? Does anybody have thoughts on that? Just um, meet, we did a lot of Zoom meetings and just talking about our own experiences and, you know, we'd often go off on quite a tangent talking about different ideas and exploring different thoughts and so on. Um, so that really helped just keeping us motivated and sharing each other's work and process. You know, we'd be sharing folders on Dropbox and stuff of images that we were working on. So that was really helpful. Um, and I think as well, considering we were doing this during the pandemic times when everything was really locked down, a lot of people were experiencing so much loss. Um, it was quite relevant as well, uh, but also a, a time when we could focus on our work without too much other distraction. So yeah, it, it was good to, to just keep each other moving on different ideas and stuff as we were moving along. Excellent, yeah. The the kind of collaboration that you guys have achieved is I think really exceptional in this show. It doesn't, you don't always see shows where there's, there are actually collaborative pieces like there are in this. Um, so yeah. I'm wondering if you guys, if one of you could tell me a little bit about some of the collaborations that were produced through this, uh, this exhibition. Yeah. Yeah, uh, do you want a quick guided tour of some of the work we've been working on? Yeah, sure. Just just uh, tell us about one or two or, or whatever, just yeah. about some of the collaborative pieces, how they came about. Okay, so we're just having a Right there, it's here now. But you need to meet that. Mom. It's the button in the corner. Okay. Okay, cool. Go. Yeah, so I was just going to quickly show you some of the work we've been working on for the Lost and Found project. Um, some of the pieces, um, well, we all, all sort of interplayed on um, working with pieces from each other. So, um, David gave um, a few of us some ceramic vessels that he'd been working on. He's a ceramic artist, um, as well as other different um, art mediums. And so he gave us some uh, vessels to work on. This is one of my pieces here, a um, ceramic vessel that I have um, adorned with various um, found objects around the house. Um, and also, Kerry has been working on mapping. Uh, I think we're going to go into more detail about these pieces later on, but just to give you a flavour of what we, what we worked on. Um, we were using some of Billy's writings and his words and incorporating those in our work as much as we could as well. Um, so it, it's really multidiscipline and just feeding off each other's creativity. I know some of my other work as well. I, I made some small books up there. Um, I use some of these writings and incorporate those in the books. Um, so, but I think individually as artists, we are going to talk in a bit more detail about our pieces, but that just to give you a flavor how we work together um, and sort of did a crossover of our work. So, yeah. yeah, excellent. 
Thank you, Anna, for that um, little tour of uh, the collaborative pieces in this show. Um, I'm thinking that this idea of, of lost and found, um, which has the static point of reference of the found, right, and the shifting groundless state of being lost is very similar to the dynamic process of creating art, right, because there are moments when you feel like you're losing things, you, you have these points where you find things, and there's like this creative process. So I'm wondering about how this is reflected in your own processes, in your art making processes. If maybe one of you would like to reflect on that a little bit, how do you make work? What is found when you start a piece or what is not found yet? Is it a process of discovery and searching or is it a process of losing something that you previously had kind of a fixed idea about? Like how does this relate to your artistic process? Maybe just one or two of you, if you could reflect on that. I guess maybe I'll speak uh, speak on that. Um, the what was interesting for me was I was given one of the vessels by David, and that's how I initially actually joined the project. And the concept as a dimensional artist, uh, you have the totality of what you see all at once. I mean, there are fantastic paintings that sort of reveal themselves as you look into detail, but unlike a book or a film or music or even sculpture, you see it all at once, right? Um, and sort of working with that idea, how do I now create a or work within a three-dimensional object to kind of give it the sense of time and, and revelation. And one of the, the, the things that struck me was I was really, I was listening to Bob Dylan one day and specifically I was listening to that song Tangled Up in Blue off the Blood on the Tra uh, Tracks which is one of the greatest albums ever and what's fantastic is that he employed this disjointed storytelling so you kind of see you hear a story told but you're switching back and forth forward backward and you're kind of getting lost in this narrative and so I thought What'd be really cool is if I created something that could actually, no matter where you entered it, it continued into a new, sort of evolved into something else. And I finally came up with the, with the idea for that um, vessel that David made to where wherever you enter, it could be a beginning, but it's also the, the end. And, and so that was the the found and the lost all at once as, as, as I was trying to figure out how, how do I work in a medium that's not really necessarily my forte. <laughs> so I, I think right there, um, Jonah right now is showing the piece. So wherever you enter it, right, it can be a beginning or the end, it can be the lost or the found, and it continues to reveal itself as you're sort of walking around and seeing it. Excellent. Thank you, Miha, for that. That's a, a beautiful piece. Oh, thank you. Um, I think, I think I'll, I'll talk to this as well because um, the content and my process really relates to lost and found. And I came a little bit late to the um, collaboration, but I my work and my mindset fit right in because making I make map inspired artwork and the process really is kind of lost and found because I make marks and I don't know where I feel that this is and then I think of a word or a phrase and it pins it down but then I'm making more marks and then I'm somewhere else and so the process of making marks having words having those dots or dashes or spaces found and kind of pinned down, even though the words that I use are ephemeral. So then you're lost again. <laughs> I mean, I never really thought it specifically like that, but my work, it is really in a space where it's here, but not here. And the process is that way too. So, so yeah, I, I, I felt that this theme worked really well with my work, even the work I had already made for the show and then work that I I then read Billy, some of Billy's text. And there's a piece that I I specifically used his words in the work. 
Um, and that was actually really interesting because it, it, it gave, it was actually a little bit more found because it was like, these are the words I'm going to use, but it wasn't specific. I didn't know which words I would use from this research. So it was an interesting process. I don't, I don't usually have the restrictions around me of I'm going to use this, like only this text. I'm usually pulling from a lot of different things. That that's uh that's super interesting, Carrie. I'm interested also in in like the sources of your your words here um, in these works. I that was one of my questions was actually going to be about the you know how you build up these these images, right? And like how you combine them with the words. And so it's I think fascinating this this intuitive approach where they're influencing each other, that mutual influencing. Um, but do you have source material that you're using? Like do you? ever base one of your the imagery in your in your work on a specific actual place or a memory or is it just like just being informed by the context that you're in at that moment and what are the sources for your words like where are you drawing those from so so like i just said i i don't usually have one source so i I keep running lists. I almost brought them because um, just anything I'm reading, I'll write down words and phrases that really speak to me. And I have notebooks of them and lots of loose leaf pieces of paper of things that I write down. But then once I'm working on a piece, I'm not thinking, I am going to make this piece about these three books that I just read. It's like my lifetime of notes. And I'll like draw upon, although the more recent things often come to the surface of what is happening in the world, it comes to the surface. So even though I'll sometimes draw on things that are from a long time ago, more of it's usually something that I more recently read. And I draw upon some scientific work. Oh, I took some photographs. Thank you, Miha of some of the many, many books, at least in the last like year or two, particularly the works I'm working on now. So it ranges from Jewish mysticism to geology. And because um, I'm thinking about the micro, like stones, not really micro, like deep time and the earth, but also about space and time. Um, and then religiosity, you know, there's Jewish texts that come into the work and some Jewish prayers, but in the, but the English translation of the words. So the word the place um, in Hebrew, makom is one of the words of God and the idea that place and God and even what the idea of that would even mean is fascinating to me. Um, so lots of words, lots of poems, um, but it's never one-to-one. It's bits and pieces, and uh, I guess like a stream of consciousness. Excellent. Um, that that idea of the place that can also be God, that idea of combining something that's so specific and grounded and, and found, if you will, with something so abstract as the concept of God is, um, I think, really inspiring here. And, and it really speaks to the kind of quality of these works and that I see them in different ways. Like I see these works on the one hand as a sort of an anti-map, like one that that goes in counter to my desire to see things that are explained, written down, defined um, and controlled, right? So in that sense, your work seems to pair this fixed topography with words that resist being fixed down to one place, these kind of abstract concepts. Um, on the other hand, these works suggest meanings to me that I would never have paired together, like they, they produce new kind of poetic constellations of meaning and, and fix them together in ways that suggest like the generation of meaning. So I'm wondering for you, do you feel like you're building meaning with these works or eroding it? And um, yeah, is this about like losing a kind of a sense of, of uh, certainty or is it about finding something or is it both? Like, how do you navigate these works? I really love that question, and but my answer is going to be just like my work that it's both. Um, I I wrote I've written a little bit about my maps being counter maps because maps pin down places and say you know this is this boundary and within this boundary is this and, and this is named this which.
which actually has a history that's interesting in and of itself. And the word counter map is usually used for, uh, like an example would be that in America, most of the, the names on maps are, are Western as opposed to Native American. So you can make a counter map with all the Native American names of the mountains. And, but, the, but the term counter map for me is that my maps are not of real taken. <laughs> so it's trying to pin down unmappable things. So it's it's kind of I don't, I mean I don't know if ironic is that way but it is it is both eroding the idea of boundaries and mapping but at the same time it's saying how can I map memory or an abstract idea so it's really both great that yeah I kind of suspected it was probably both of those things but just wanted to kind of dive into that a little bit more. Um, do you, if, if you wouldn't mind, could you talk a little bit specifically about the work in this show from the stillness and from the thunder? That one, I think has, it seems really intriguing. And so if we could, maybe Jonah could show yeah, us that. So in the meantime, there you go. Okay, um, am I on? Mm -hmm. okay. This one is called From the Stillness of the Thunder. And um, I started this over the summer, just when I, so the first few months of the pandemic, I brought work home and I was working really small. And then sometime over the summer, I realized there weren't that many people in my studio building. And so I went back into my studio and I felt like I really want to work big. And so I unrolled a piece of paper and um, a lot of this one started out with outwards. It just felt like, like all of this need to have movement because of And um, and then all of the political things started happening. And so that is why it says the urgency of this moment. Um, so a, a lot of the work is about deep time geology and the ephemeralness of life and light and all of that. But then there's also um, things that come up that have more to do with trying to find like well the vulnerability and frailty i guess for me sometimes i like the idea of things that mean two things at once so life is vulnerable and frail or government is vulnerable and frail so uh, like a lot of the times I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about more than one thing and i like words and places that can can hold more than one idea at once and there was so much going on between the pandemic and politics and then just confinement being at home and then release of being in my studio. And so that's that's where this comes from. Excellent. Thank you, Carrie. That that's uh, such a powerful work and such a work from this moment, right? Um, I'd like to ask a few questions to David, if you have a moment, David, to kind of come closer to the camera. Can, can we switch up a little bit so David comes in front of the camera so I can ask him some questions? That would be great. I don't need to. Excellent. All right. Thanks, David. So um, in your, your garden of lost and found that you designed incorporates structures um, which are on display in the gallery, but it also it, it also incorporates a garden. Like you chose to site it in an actual 
um, landscape, right? So it's not just hardscape and architecture. You made a deliberate choice to create a garden that incorporates plants. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about that decision um, to use the materials of the garden, the space of the garden, and how that relates to the kinds of intellectual or emotional experiences that you would hope to catalyze in viewers of this space. So I'm interested in that botanical aspect related to the architectural here. Oh, uh, so am I, but yeah. Um, so, so let me step back for a moment. I, I'm, I'm not a storyteller. Um, my work has mainly looked at pattern and looked at objects and things like that. So when it's confronted with, you know, how do you convey something as broad or as specific as loss of bounds, it's really, through you know clay or through sculpture, it's it's a little a little daunting, you know. Um, so I'm a landscape architect also, at least I was or I was trained to be, and I thought that gardens um, and a it place the installation it, um, was a, a, a vehicle for me to start to look at, to start to tell a story about a particular idea and place. So I, I fumbled around for quite a while trying to figure out, well, where would this garden be? You know, any kind of garden. So I, I have owned five acres up in Hainesville and, and I sort of model, use that as sort of the starting point, but that piece of two acre land sort of moved all over the world at some point in my imagination. So then I, I started to say, well, yeah, Start to look at it as if I was designing a, an installation art piece, which I've done before. And um, so I said, well, I can create sort of the backdrop and create the, the, the environment for uh, things that might be able to tell a story. And so I, I came up with the, this idea of a, a, a reflecting pond and, and um, a garden. Uh, it's come much more well, somewhat informal in the middle of the woods. Um, uh, Kissip County, and uh, started from that point, and then I thought that, um, well, maybe the way to tell a story is through uh, the architectural elements that are put into that garden. Um, and so I, I went back. I have this uh, really, I really enjoy uh, the idea of garden follies, which are date back to you know Queen Elizabeth and Kew Gardens and whatever. You know, buildings that are have um, are fun to look at and fun to, fun to wonder about are, are focal points within the garden, um, but really have no function. You know, they're just they're sculptures, and they they are um, both a possession but also inspire um, you know, a, a wonder. So. Let me jump in right there and ask you a little bit about that idea of function and lack of function in the follies, because that really strikes me that you. You have this interest in follies, which are not necessarily like the first architectural kind of genre that people think about when they think about architecture, right? Like there's such a specific cool thing that you that you seized on here. And th this idea of them being this kind of playful structure that has no function um, makes me really wonder, like, does it in your work here, does it shift the idea of what a functional architectural object can be? Um, or is it, you know, like, I, I get the feeling that there is a, maybe a function here and maybe you're making an intervention in this history of follies, like maybe follies are more useful than we give them credit for. I don't know. What do you think? Oh, well, you know, they, they, um, when I say function, you know, it's, it, you know, they're not kitchens, they're not, you know, office towers, they're not, you know, um, but, but they have sort of a symbolic function and a storytelling function in my eyes. And that, that's, that was how I was able to get into the into the looking at lost and found. So um, what I so I, I designed the garden and then I um, Jonah's showing the, sort of the ceramic uh, architectural models of my follies. Because I thought, well, you know, I make follies all the time and they're you know silly, useless pieces of ceramic sometimes. And um, so I, I have the two that are shown as one is um, a bell tower uh, that connect connects heaven and earth. So the idea of the bell chamber would be above, above ground, but also in the ground. And I'll, I'll come back to this in a second because I think Niao uh, would like to talk about that part of the collaboration. 
Um, and the, the other um, folly that I made a model of is an observatory. And it's a, a observatory that uh, it somehow it sort of tracks the path of the sun and the moon and the sky. And if you're to draw a line from the sun to the observatory through the earth, it pop out at a, a location. And so I came, I said, well, I'm not a storyteller. Maybe I should start to be one. So I started writing poetry, you know. And they actually came to the realization there's a lot of bad poetry out there, but I just thought like, I'd keep going. And so I wrote poetic observations about places. And one of the poems that, I, that are, is on the wall is about a, um, a gas station in Laredo, Texas in the late afternoon in the middle of the summer and what that would smell like, what it sounded like. But, um, but um, for me, the most gratifying part of this is um, what Mia has taken from this and ran with because in a million years, I wouldn't imagine that you could create sound that would relate to you know, useless follies in an imaginary garden about something about Washington Island. So I'm going to just throw it to Miha and he can tell you what he did because it's really cool. Uh, so uh, a few a few months back, Dave, David was, uh, he, emailed me one day and he said, well, I didn't know you mess around with music. And I said, I, a little bit. Um, so he said he had this idea to where the this structures that he was building, this imaginary world would actually have another dimension and that would be sound. And, uh, and so he's, he originally asked if we could just design some sort of pattern that would sound like a bell tower jingle that you know uh, and would go together with with that bell tower and then i thought well it'd be really great if some of the other aspects of what he was doing such as the follies could also have a music musical component so um yeah that's it, it came out of that and actually i, I have the i'm not gonna uh <laughs> murder you all with the longer tracks but I'll just give you a, a, a sample of the, the bell tower jingle, um, which kind of goes in, I'm not sure how the volume is going to be, but it sounds like that. <laughs> So I mean that's that's the 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 jingle and it just continues to loop, and to, to incorporate the idea of lost and found, the um, what we did is we found some metallic objects like spoons and and old coffee cans and stuff like that, and recorded the the hitting of those objects and then added some um, some filters on it just the delay and stuff like that, but. The objects that we found to create these sounds, metallic sounds, were actually also found objects. So, to kind of stay stay true to the theme of the show. That's that. I'm so impressed that you guys made that out of found objects. It sounded so polished. That's a, it's wow. Thank you. Fascinating. Excellent. Well, if if we um, could do another little switch around and maybe get Anna to come in front of the computer, so maybe she could talk a bit about her work. Um, I think that I'm I'm really interested, Anna, in in your work. See resilient escapement here. I don't know if maybe we could get Jonah to show it. It's in the corner, back corner of the gallery. There, um, there are elements in it that seem classical, right? Um, so there's a container that resembles an amphora. There are miscellaneous objects that seem like they might be patinated marble. They have this kind of like, you know, pale quality to them, but with, with kind of a patina. Um, and they're they're hanging together as though they're, they're something that's been kind of dredged out of the, the ocean or, or maybe the Mediterranean Sea, given the amphora, right? Um, but at the same time, 
when you look closely at them, they're, they're actually um, objects that are very contemporary. It includes things like a flip-flop or tea bags. So I'm wondering here, the, the associations span this seemingly contradictory range, right? From garbage to precious antiquities. Can you tell us a bit about how you're thinking about these objects in relationship to these kind of dichotomies, past and present, detritus and treasure? Yes. Um, well, John, this is Locating the piece here in your space, and I'm sure that he'll be exploring the surface with us as he um, homes in on the piece. So it looks like he might expose the screen a little bit first. But um, anyway, so I start off with one of David's vessels, and um, the work that I usually do, I'm I'm more material-based artist, so I respond to materials and and what I can do to them. And I, I really like to take uh, found objects or um, unprecious materials and play with those. I, I find that um, I can be more creative with something of little value so that I can sort of give permission to just mess it up as such. Um, so um, using um, the David's vessel here, uh, I then created a, a sort of a network that I could weave found objects into. Um, and really, it, it, the piece is about honouring the mundane. And I think in the most part, we all live fairly average lives, um, non-eventful, full of uh, routine and domestic chores and so on. So I really wanted uh, to, to honour that and just um, let it be seen in a different way and give people the opportunity to explore that surface. and and really then kind of bridge that idea of, of present and past um, and exploring those surfaces and, and um, you know, giving the viewer something to uh, relate and explore and have their own experiences with um, when they recognise the pieces. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of that was kind of really important to me, just, just sort of, um, I don't know, just allowing people to, to see mundane objects in a, a sort of a, an, an art form. Um, and I'll just ask Joan if we can perhaps go back to that piece. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, if I don't know whether Joan can give us some close ups on that piece, but and then you can have a look at uh, some of the areas with me. And see what you can find but yeah I mean there's a calculator in there a watch a bit of pasta some plumbing um, with a tea bag because I've always got tea on the go in my studio um, and uh, there's some rubber gloves in there I don't know there's just all sorts of mush and mess that really I think with the treatment I give them it, it does um, you know sort of want you to draw in on it and, and look at those surfaces and, and that aging process uh, it looks as if it is dragged up from the sea as you say yeah it's what i call um messy imperfection because <laughs> it's just cut you know it's just very messy but that's what i like about it yeah <laughs> there's a there's a real beauty <laughs> that, right? that kind of um, organic feeling, order yeah. and disorder, and, and yeah, that that uh, that transformation that you're that you're bringing. So we're seeing these things with a new set of eyes. We're not seeing these things in the way we normally do, but they become yeah. something more. I'm wondering also about your the works that we might define as paintings, right? The more two dimensional canvases that you have in the other gallery. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in the relationship here between the kind of high modernist visual concerns of abstract painting that I'm seeing here, but also these uh, material qualities of product packaging, which is collaged into these works, right? And we see that because of mainly the, the edges where the shadows are casting against the wall. I think that's fascinating, that little tell that gives, us, gives that away. Um, so how do these materials relate to your process here? And, and are you doing a sort of visual archaeology here where you're making a, kind of a drawing a line between the modernism mm -hmm. of painting and also of product packaging and consumerism and that sort of, you know, these two things that are that are 
like hand in hand that we don't usually think about? Yeah. Yeah. So as I say, really, I, I feel as if a lot of my work is generated from materials, the materials that I'm playing with. And um, this last year, I with um, again, I, I just enjoy non-precious materials and the I've been deconstructing boxes because we've had a lot of Amazon boxes um, coming by our home recently, um, but not just those. Um, a lot of these are sort of cereal boxes started from, you know, uh, tea bag boxes, um, that type of thing. And I've been deconstructing those. And I just really enjoy how those boxes are made. I mean, there's, there's so many, so much detail and thought that goes into a cardboard box. That, you know, the strength of it from the start, just out of really just, just thin cardboard and the folds and the tabs and then you've got the text and that, you know, that and then the strength of it. So I've been deconstructing those surfaces and building up a new surface to work from. Um, and again, it's just sort of this contradiction between, um, you know, sort of fine art and then just the mundane and the non-precious and just really enjoying those new surfaces that I'm making and um, you know I just love the rawness of those and I've also been working into more three-dimensional work I think really it's been the last two well more than two years three to four years I suppose I've been playing around with more three-dimensional work um, but really I think I've been embracing that more so this last year um, and the piece that Jen is focusing on at the moment um, you know, that's, that's quite a large, definitely three-dimensional piece. You can see the paintings are a little flatter, um, but still have a lot of texture and surface. Um, and so now really I'm, I'm doing, doing more three-dimensional work as well, which I think is a, a nice um, contrast to the rest of my work. It kind of feels like it, it holds a body of work more to have those two elements in it. Yeah, I'm wondering if you if you'd mind telling us a little bit more about specifically your three dimensional piece in this show. We are all superheroes. Yeah, sure. So I started with one of David's vessels, and I wanted to kind of treat it a little bit differently from the first piece that you saw. Um, I wanted that to be a little bit more playful, and. Um, um, maybe Jonah could show us that one. It's in the other yeah. room there. It's just to your left there, Jonah. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, and I decided to treat it a little bit like a willow pattern design with the finished paintwork on it. So hence the, the blue and the white. Um, I'd ask friends if they could dig through some of their you know, trashy stuff and come up with some, some donated bits of crap for me to stick on. So it's very random, the things, and I've got some fairy lights in there. You can tell it was around about Christmas time. There, I can see. Um, but yeah, one of my friends uh, gave me a, a little soft toy from one of her children, and that's perched right at the top, and it's got like a superhero cape, and he's wrapped around the top, if you can see in there, there he goes. And so that's, where the title came from, we're all superheroes. Um, it, it wasn't, you know, it's kind of like an afterthought with titling, which I think most of the time titles are. And I tend to be fairly random with my titles and it tends to be fairly spur of the moment and just kind of some quick little thought that comes into my head. I, oh, there's a hair color in there, I can see it. Um, but yeah, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a playful piece again with found objects and um, I don't know, I just like the kind of reach it has with high and low art on this piece. Um, it's, it sort of goes between either being really ugly or really, I don't know, appealing. And, and I, the, the pedestal it's on was something that I'd hauled over from England 20 years ago and ended up in my attic. And we were looking for pedestals and I thought, hang on, I've still got that old pedestal up there. And I thought it was kind of perfect for that because um, it's that kind of decorative over the top. Not quite sure whether it works or not, but I don't know. In the fullness of time, I'm, I may take some of the fairy lights and just continue the whole face as part of the piece a little bit more and integrate that a bit more. But um, yeah, so that's another one. 
Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, that, I love also that thing that you mentioned about the blue and white, the inspiration of like blue and white uh, ceramic wear. And mm -hmm. it's, it's also that thing that you were saying about high and low, right? Because on the one hand, you have some ceramics that are painted with cobalt blue that are extraordinarily valuable and precious objects. And then you have others that are super functional things that we think of as just kind of like a craft that isn't really, you know, yeah. that, that's it's wonderful, all the, the dichotomies in that. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Miha, I wonder if I might ask you a few questions. Sure. Um, so your work, Flight into Egypt, in this show, as with many of the works in this show, gives me this feeling of seeing something that is that's showing the echoes through history, the losing and the finding, the rediscovery of themes that return and return again over the ages. Um, in this painting, you base a contemporary depiction of a refugee family on depictions of the Christian story of the Holy Family escaping to Egypt as refugees. So what are some of the sources that you're quoting from here? Are these refugees fleeing a specific conflict? Does the image of the refugee family here help the viewer find historical precedent that can orient us in this time that we're in today? Um, one of the things that I was really interested in doing is this, um, the long-standing tradition of, of history painting as, as in this grand, you know, the, the most elevated of, of pursuits is to, to work in this theme of, of history painting. And there were very specific requirements, what qualifies as a history painting. So I wanted to sort of invert or maybe transgress some of those ideas. And, and, and the first thing was the approach to how it was painted. I mean, uh, these were the uh, most of these uh, the, most of the material in the painting were uh, not very, um, uh, you know, uh, fine art uh, materials. So a lot of, uh, there was coffee and, 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 and uh, charcoal, which kind of blended the two and a lot of uh, house paints, so commercial paint. But um, one of the things that it resonated with me was that when I first came to America in 2000, I, I remember sort of not having really, my expectations were um, very high. And I was really kind of shocked the questions that I would get asked when I first came here as an immigrant. And, and but I, there was a specific um, event that this episode that I recall, somebody, I was in America and somebody said to me, we are God fearing people. And that phrase really kind of stuck with me. And with everything that was sort of happening last year, uh, politically, um, and just this intolerance towards, uh, well, not by everybody, clearly, but this, you know, the, um, that for people that, that were pre pre pretending or projecting to be God fearing, I thought, well, there are passages in the book that you're celebrating that speak on the, the flight of immigrants. So how can you kind of have this, you know, hypocrisy? Uh, and in a way that that's really what began to drive this piece um, and kind of trying to comment on, on, on my own experiences as an immigrant, uh, experiences of even growing up in, in, in the Balkans in, in the 90s where there was the, the, the war in the Balkans and seeing uh, firsthand uh, you know, people from Croatia and Bosnia and, and Serbia as they were as, as they were relocated and people that have lost everything. Uh, that there's something really absolutely gut wrenching when you see uh, somebody be like their entire existence existence has been erased. And so I wanted to kind of try to see if there's a way to try to capture that uh, in a painting. And there's even a reference in this painting specifically to a, um, to a Frida Kahlo painting, which is called Self-Portrait on a Border Between Mexico and America. And uh, you sort of see there's a division where Mary is standing and one side is all red and the other side seems to be much more kind of grounded in, in, um, in our world. So like between the lushness and sort of the dried out area. Yeah. Thank you, Miha. I'm, I'm also wondering about your work, the, it, the work 
the Atlas of the Void. Um, if you could maybe tell us a little bit about the text in that one. Sure. There was a when when uh, when uh, Billy sent the the pages. I, I started really kind of. Uh, reading a lot of those um, passages and one of the writers that I've uh, always loved was um, is uh, Joseph Campbell and sort of the idea of mythology and, and the journey and there was a th there were some correlations to me between between um, some of those aspects and and the text that was being found so I would try to see if there are certain passages that I thought were really comprehensive and sort of kind of had the largeness of, of these big events um, in themselves. And so I, I originally drew out the image and then I would, I would use uh, almost like a collage process to cut out the pieces. And sometimes the pieces themselves, because I didn't want to crop part of the text would end up informing the image in a way because I had to sort of include that part and vice versa. Sometimes by, by you know, the contour of the figure, part of the, the text had to be cropped and it sort of changed the context of that text. So, um, and I wanted to somehow relate to, again, to this idea of lost and found. So I try to um, employ the process and it's particularly the aesthetic of one of the very first shows that uh, I've done uh, back in 2013, I think. And sort of, uh, which it looks like a very, um, um, you know, um, almost like a graphic design, like comic books, which that was <laughs> what originally attracted me to the art, uh, arts, uh, was the fact that I always wanted to draw comics. So- Yeah, it, you do also, yeah. I do, I do, yeah. And sort of this, you know, this, um, conversation between what qualifies as fine art and what qualifies as something that's going to warp your young mind. Um, so, and I, we have more and more of that um, kind of aesthetic crossing over into fine arts and, and kind of uh, eradicating those, those boundaries. So I, I always try to find it fascinating to see if there's a way if I can maybe poke that bear a little bit more. Excellent. I'm wondering, Jonah, could you move the camera a little bit to the left? There's another piece there that has some roses on it that's um, called the Psalm of Passage after Anselm Kiefer, that one, yep. Um, Miha, could you tell us a little bit about this one? I'm really interested in a certain aspect of this one because it, it stands out, it's got three dimensions because those roses that you see there are in relief popping out from the canvas, standing out. But at the same time, this is actually a piece that extends into a fourth dimension, right? Because it includes time, because you actually made music for this. So can you talk a little bit about that, your decision-making process, this piece, and how these things fit together? So in, in the show that I was just talking about, The Trojan Soul from 2013, I, I had just prior to that show heard this horrible news that, you know, the average uh, viewing of, uh, by audience is only seven seconds when it comes to the artwork and I thought that's really <laughs> for us the visual artists that's really kind of sad so I thought if there's a way to, that I could maybe manipulate uh, for lack of a better word um, so that show in 2013 was the first time I started messing around with with time so I composed all these soundscapes that one would scan and then sort of it was forced people to look at the painting because they were listening to the to the song to finish so when it came to this one i it was originally began and and the reason it's it's an homage to Anselm Kiefer was in after the not the last election but one prior to that there was um there was a bit of a lull in my creativity because i didn't want to do art that was going to sort of be very responsive to the fact that you know the former president became at that point the president and I remember kind of thinking like, I, I, I really want to do something about it, but I don't want to do about that. And I sort of felt a little frustrated. And then one day I walked into Sam and in his glory, there was this beautiful painting by Anselm Kiefer called The Order of the Night. And I thought that it was almost like a, some sort of sign that was sent or presented to me. And I thought that's the key. It's, it's to kind of keep, uh, 
you know, if, if you are going to have a, a political commentary, a social commentary to kind of keep it timeless, you know, by not being very specific. So this piece began last year during the um, right kind of at, at, at everything was kind of beginning to unravel worldwide. Um, and, and so I wanted to really kind of tap into that. Uh, and I was walking with, with our dog one day and I found these weird little cones that look a lot like roses. And um, I still don't know what kind of cones they are, but I just started collecting them and I'll put them in my pockets and not really thinking they were gonna be anything other than I thought they were fascinating. So when, when I started thinking about this piece, which again, uses a lot of uh, non-traditional materials, I, I thought, you know, with Ansem Kiefer, he has that real tactile uh, quality of non-traditional material. So I ended up spray painting the, the, the pine cones and then adding them to the surface to kind of create the sense of three-dimensional flowers that were coming out of the ground. Um, but yeah, that's one of the things is that, that is all of my work is often each piece is individually uh, informed by the subject matter. So that's why a lot of my work seems to kind of not look alike and it kind of jumps all over the place because uh, I, I kind of think of it as, uh, uh, it's, you know, e each piece is its own thing. Uh, it's its own object and its own kind of exploration. Thank you so much, Miha. That's fascinating. And it's a great place, I think, to kind of wrap this up because we are at the end of our time here. But I do think we should open it up to questions because maybe some of the people who are attending the talk have questions for you all. And I'm going to... Say one thing. If there are any questions or even if there are, do you know how are you able to call up the video from the the Farmer website just because Jonah's here and he's been doing all these videoing? But I did he worked with me on a piece where I was holding David's sculpture and I'm walking around with it, and I feel like he was part of that collaboration too. I don't know if Miha, if you could share it. The little, it's like a one minute clip of me walking around. It's on the SHIFT website. But we could take questions. Sure, why, why don't we take questions and I'll look for the video. If, if anyone has a question for any of the artists or all the artists, just go ahead and unmute yourself and just ask the question. And if you don't want to say it, you can also type it in the chat and then we'll read it for you. Okay, I'll get it started just because I think people are thinking like, oh, maybe I didn't think of the question yet. The question can be anything. It can be about a specific piece. It can be about, you know, what did you eat for breakfast this morning? Anything you want. But the first question I have for all of you is, what are you do going to do next? Did this give you new ideas? Did this show kind of push you in a different direction? Do you have like new thoughts that you're, that you're working on now as a consequence of the works that you've done for this show? I'm going to let David but one of the things um Billy and I can think about and talk about a little bit is that maybe it's about to be a third piece in a, a trilogy of works that we've been working on. The first being um we work on a uh, project about home. And this collaborative about less and bound, and then the next project might be uh, concerned about a, um, a journey about how do you being, I guess, self uh, self empowered to actually um, confront things and make decisions when confronted with uh, lost and found, lost and found, 
at home. And so I think uh, it's a seed of an idea that's going to start to like, germinate. We'll see if it goes anywhere. Yeah. 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 Excellent. <laughs> we have a request for Jonah, if you're available to do this, if you could walk around slowly and just show the pieces one at a time, just once. I have a question for Neha. Um, I saw in that piece that was the, um, with the roses, there was other textures happening. Can you share what, what's, what else is incorporated in there that is making like those bumpy textures and whatnot? So um, the materials that were primarily used for the top half of the painting, which is the more texturized uh, upper half, though, um, that was, it began, I think the, the it began with um, house paint that was probably out of date. So it began to kind of turn a little bit. And so it started to kind of create a bit of a, a sculpture effect and so it was applied um, and then I drug it through the ground outside to where it disrupted it even more and there's uh, some pebbles and 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 dirt that's attached to it and then there's several more layers of um, commercial paint and I think ultimately in the end uh, there was wall compound as well as um, some um, flakes you know they're like uh um, iridescent flakes so if you actually look at under an angle it begins to kind of shine and shimmer a little bit that's awesome dirty uh, water that's right i'm sorry um those <laughs> those dirty water I, I love dirty water i have another question too since you um have been working with sound and whatnot i was wondering if you've done any video that you're or if you're interested in creating any video to go with your work or yes so, so i i am i i've done some solo work in the past and i'm currently working with uh with a partner where we're like a duet that's what the vanity host is and i think that the project that we're trying to tackle on uh next might be a, a full-on um uh, audio album and uh we'd love to incorporate some video too but and he's a very creative artist himself. Um, so the question is, where do we take it next? <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks. Thank you. And um, I found that video that um, Carrie was talking about. So I can share that. Um, it's it's uh, this one, right, Carrie, the, with the walking? I'll play one more time. <laughs> in, my, in my marketing songs, I might need to tell you all that we, we have a YouTube channel where we're going to be uploading both Neha makes some videos that are of the lost and found, and then there's also going to be a video uploaded slower walkthrough of the show. And then there's videos of past shows, so you can check out the Shift Gallery YouTube channel. And I'd just like to add as well, we are open in May on Saturday, 12 to 5. So um, I'm going to be up to the end of May. So we've got another couple of weekends if anyone wants to call by. And we'll go all by appointment. Yeah, if there's anything particularly you want to look at and um, you want to contact one of the artists, then we'd be happy to meet you down here and um, to give you a guiding tour. But yeah, if you'd like to pop by, we'd we'll love to see you. And it's a really wonderful exhibition, everyone. So if you get a chance to see it, you should. It's really, it's great in person. And especially some of the works, like Carrie's works that have these beautiful, minuscule words that are carefully written into them, really hard to see on a camera. So if you can get in there and see them in person, I think it's a really, it's a, a completely different experience. Does anyone else have any questions before we wrap up? 
No. Okay, well, we're we're just going to be here for a little while if, in, if anyone is lingering because they don't want to ask questions in front of other people. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. And this was this was wonderful talking to you all. Thanks to the artists for being here. If we could give them a little round of applause. That'd be great. So you can... Applause for Krista.